Hey, this is Zara Anthony, and you're watching the Mitch Lafon and Jeremy White Show. The Mitch Lafon and Jeremy White Show. The Mitch Lafon and Jeremy White Show. Available wherever you stream. Catch up on past interviews and episodes on demand now. Subscribe so you don't miss any of it. Let's let's get right into this. I mean, it's already a train wreck. Uh, brand new, live from Hollywood, coming out on July 15th. You can pre-order it now wherever you get your music. Of course, the uh, uh, Contagious performance now available. Uh, you can pick it up. Uh, go and watch it on YouTube. I mean, the, this record just sounds ridiculous. And we want to talk about the band and the performances and everything. Welcome back to the show. And the first time I'm actually getting to talk to her, the one, the only, the icon, the legend, Orianti. There she is. That's right. Oh, I... Thank you for having me on. <laughs> oh, we're great. I'm I'm in Nashville right now, as I said before, and I've got my guitar here. I've got Randy with me. We just played a show. Well, actually, we played a show yesterday, Virginia Beach, with my band, and then flew here. So, yeah, it's been great. Nice. It's nice to- <laughs> is, is Randy sort of your number one these days? Um, the one that travels with me is, well, actually, I have two. The, the gold one is gold top. Uh, custom 24 and my purple prs which you guys have probably seen a lot and uh yeah my brand new one to the lotus bloom which is really cool that psychedelic um prs just came out um that's my new signature and love that one as well so right. i kind of have three it's interesting you've always been a prs player from as long as i can remember i mean like what is it about those guitars that you've just always gravitated to you know they're just super comfortable for me to play mm-hmm. and um because of santana as well like i mean when i was right. 10 years old my dad put on a Santana record. He's playing the PRS, so I had to have one. Um, I was crying and screaming. <laughs> you know, I wanted one so bad. Um, and then I couldn't put it down. You know, when I got, it was like the holy grail when you, you know, got a PRS. You know, back then I was like, oh, my God. And and having pole support and then having my own signature models is, is very surreal. I mean, I just, you know, I don't think it's real still. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, as, yeah. as as a kid coming up listening to music and playing guitar, you're like, I'm never going to have a signature guitar. And then you do. And it's like, what? I don't know. <laughs> and even when I'm holding, I'm like, is this real? Like, it has my, okay, <laughs> has my name on it. But, you know, because I'm such a fan of guitars. I'm just a fan of everything, you know, um, when it comes to, you know, making the guitars and everything. I mean, I grew up playing Gibsons as well. Um, my dad is a guitar collector, so left-handed. So I, I started left-handed and then played with his you know, Fenders, Gibsons, and and all that. Um, but yeah, for some reason, it just feels really comfortable for me to be playing the PRA. Not to say that I don't play vintage, you know, Strats or Gibsons and stuff here right. and there. It's interesting that you were exposed to like left-handed instruments and you found your way to the right. Yeah, you know, um, I can write with my left hand. It's it's really strange. My dad, I mean, he he's a left-handed player, and he said to me. Don't learn left-handed because when you go into a guitar store, there's like two guitars in the corner. <laughs> Back in the corner, all dusty that nobody's touched for like years. <laughs> right. There's not you know, a choice. And he's like, you should learn left-handed. So I, I, I quickly, you know, switched. Yeah. 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 I'm happy I did. Uh, the funny thing is, I was just telling Mitch as we were getting ready for this interview. I was like, you know, I, I have a funny Orianti story. When you first put out Believe, I, I've had my parents plan a day trip an hour down south over the border in upstate New York. We went down to Plattsburgh. I went to Walmart to buy the CD and I dug it up today and I, I found my original copy of Believe. <laughs> so, so there there that is. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like an OG Orianti diehard, I guess. Uh, That's right. Uh, well, thank you for getting that record. Yeah, yeah I was really you know, proud of that one because, you know, it was the first like major release and having, you know, signed with Indoscope and we went extensively on this radio tour. I just remember I didn't sleep for like two or three years for that whole thing. But yeah. it was fun. Well, I love the fact that, A, you were a woman playing awesome pop rock, but you also shredded and you had Steve Vai on the CD. I'm like, this is like, this is exactly what I need in my life right now. That's right. You know, it was, it was really cool that that Steve was willing to do that song with me. I mean, I, my first support was actually opening for Steve when I was 14 years old and in, in Adelaide, Australia, Heaven Night Club. And we stayed in contact. He's like an uncle to me, you know, so I would always like send him demos and he would write back and it's just, you know, always supportive and, and, um, you know, just, uh, he's an amazing human. Um, so I asked, yeah. Hey, do you want to do an instrumental song for, for my record? And he was like, absolutely. So I went over to his home and we wrote and recorded highly strung that day. So he, he had this riff idea and he's like, let's go back and forth, mm-hmm. make it kind of wild. And, and, um, yeah, it just came together really fast. And the, the, the guitars you hear on that are actually the demo guitars, the ones we just 
you know, put down that day. Oh, so, wow. So writing it. So it really yeah. happened really quickly in the studio. Like it was literally a one afternoon, like, oh, let's do this song, crank it out. Yeah. Yeah. In Steve's studio at his home and, and literally just walked in there with my guitar and he's like, have this riff. And then we just went back and forth and he recorded it. We tried to re-record it again, but it didn't sound right. You know, him doing like, his parts and I did my parts and it just sounded very, you know, when you're in the room together, it's just a different vibe. It's all about the vibe. Yeah. So. Yeah. It to- totally is. Right. It's funny, though. I mean, a lot of those times, those are some of the most magical performances, right? The one off the cuff, sort of like first take, like with all the grease and all the all the schmutt on it. Yep. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think it was just more inspired. Like when you go to re-record like solos and, you know, in the room, you're like a tough. It's just, I don't know. It's strange. You're sitting there with the engineer. He's hitting record and you just kind of, <laughs> I don't <laughs> are, know. Are you really critical of yourself in the studio or like, are you overanalyzing every note that you play or are you just like, oh, that one's got the yeah. vibe? No, I'm horrible. Like I will solo until everyone in the room's like, okay, we've got it. Like, please and just go home. <laughs> take you know um is the best one because i keep on going because you know it's like mixing you know you're never happy with it so i will stay in there and like my fingers are bleeding and everyone's ears are tired so yeah there's a, there's a certain point that's why i you know with the producers i've worked with and engineers i trust them to tell me oh no i think we've got it you know and and all of that but i'm really critical for sure yeah absolutely Speak, i was gonna say f- speaking of fingers bleeding was the last time your fingers bled <laughs> Um, not too long ago, actually, making the last record. We did a Rock Candy, actually, we did it in 14 days, the whole album, wow. wrote it. In- and, um, yeah, you know, it's like when you're soloing every day, like my fingers are always like, you know, cut up and bloody and they don't look pretty. So I try not to <laughs> yeah. put them on film. Yeah, they're just, you got to dig in, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I guess it. so, right? I, it's I, Look. A-N- are you are you still running scales every day and trying to improve your playing, or is it still like conditioning? Like, what's what's your routine like? Yeah, I'm always sitting with my guitar, like watching TV and going over scales and just things. You know, I mean, it's not really like scales; it's just playing a lot and finding new things, like coming up with stuff myself. I find, um, you know, that's kind of where I'm at right now. But I I do go on to YouTube and look up different players, and actually country players lately because um, mm-hmm. I'm really into the chicken. Fish. Thing. so i'm here in nashville so you know, there's so many good guitar players you get down to any local bar and they're like oh holy crap you know? yeah you got to get <laughs> together with brent mason yeah yeah absolutely um talk to me a little bit about this live album live from hollywood because i've had a chance to hear it and it is just absolutely smoking the guitar playing is ridiculous but oh. your voice is just i mean it's awesome uh, is, is this a truly, truly live record? Was there a little bit of touch up afterwards? And and talk to me about you know extending the solos and sort of really adding meat to the bone to these songs. Yeah, so it is. It's a very live record. We threw it together really fast. Um, mm-hmm. Bourbon Room and um, incredible musicians joining me. I mean, Michael Bearden, got Glenn Sobel on drums, Nick Mayberry on guitar. One of my good friends, Carmen Vandenberg, came in from Bone. She flew off. She got off a plane from Italy, came straight there and, and played. And and honestly, we just tried to capture that real life feeling. But it was, I mean, it was mixed in surround. So there were some, you know, fixes, EQing, right. um, fixes taken out, people screaming different things, profanities into microphones. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Was it in real surround or was it like spatial audio? Well, we had... Yeah, well, the engineer, Bill Mims, he's awesome. He had, uh, I guess, all these different um, microphones around the entire, um, you know, club. And he said that people had found the mic, so that like, yelling weird shit. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> and, and, like, right, you, should, you should have made that a bonus track where the track whatever, you know. Yeah, just the audio. The scene is just, <laughs> just people swearing, just, like like Ode to Tipper Gore on the Warrant uh, album. Yeah, just be like the crowd banter. <laughs> It was really funny. funny. Um, it was like really crazy. So I was all right. That, but other than that, no, it's, it's it's very live. Yeah, you can hear some. I mean, there's a, left a lot of kind of stuff in there that I probably would have, you know, fixed. But we kept the the live feeling of it. You know, definitely. Yeah, yeah, that's what I like about it. I like that live vibe. Uh, let me just quickly go back in in, in your history a little bit. Uh, talk to me about your moment with Alice Cooper and and deciding to leave because. I remember having a conversation with with Glenn, and I said to him, "I said I'm glad she left because 
she went off and did this RSO with Richie, and it's perfect. It, it's, it's soulful, it's bluesy, it's rock. It's exactly what I want from Orianti, and it gave us Nita, so it's a win-win. Um, talk to me about your, and by the way, that, that's meant as an absolute compliment to both of you. Um, talk to me about the joining the band and then saying, you know what, I'm going to go do RSO and go, go, go do some live shows with Richie and, and just go do that for a while. Yeah, so what happened, I mean, I was with Alice for about three and a half years at mm -hmm. that point, um, and then... Uh, I met Richie probably, I think it was New Year's Eve, yeah, New Year's Eve in Maui. And um, he showed up last minute and we just ended up jamming, never met him before. Um, and then after that show, he kept on messaging me, come over, come and jam, you know, let's hang out. So I was like, okay, that'd be awesome. So he did. And um, we actually just got together, you know, we were, we were dating first. Right. And then uh, I was on the road with, with Alice. And then he's like, you know, I have this idea. Why don't we do a duo? And um you know put out a record together so um and i was like yeah that sounds cool and you know he had this whole plan and so i he said but you got to tell alice like you know we've got to do this full time like kind of thing so mm -hmm. i went in and it was it was hard for me obviously because i alice is like in this whole family you know what i mean right. and, and that, so i went in and, and i said to alice you know i'm gonna uh, join richie for, for a bit and do this project and and uh, he was really, you know, cool and supportive of whatever, you know, I wanted to do. And uh, he's like another dad and Cheryl as well. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we went and we made a record. It was about four years with Bob Rock and, and it just sort of came out and then never sort of happened. <laughs> and it just, you know, I don't know. So that, that's that. But, hey, we make good music. So. Oh, well, listen, I still <laughs> listen to it. I still think it's great. Yeah. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. What, what was it like working with Bob? Our great Bob's, comedian. You know, it's Bob Rock. He's he's awesome. He's such a he's such a you know a drum guy as well. He gets the best sounding drums, the biggest sounding. I mean, it's epic stuff. You know, when he goes to EQ stuff and mic things, and I'm really into the engineering aspect of things as well and how right. things are recorded. So I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to that. So it was really wonderful and an honor to, to work with Bob. Absolutely. What's something that you took away from those sessions that you now incorporate into your own daily sort of recording? I'm sorry. I said I was going to say, you know, what's something that you took away from Bob in those sessions that you put into your own recording style these days? Well, I mean, he just goes really like, you know, open and big with the choruses and just the drum sounds in general and the guitars and you know, it's just it's epic sounding and um yeah, he's just that guy, you know, all the records he's done. I mean, you know, it's incredible. So, yeah, um yeah, definitely very inspired by you know, working with Bob for sure. You can't go wrong with the cannonball snare. I mean, come on, slippery when no. wet. What more do you want? Dr. Um, Feelgood. Right. <laughs> Dr. Sorry. Um, where do you find yourself more comfortable in terms of a player? Do, do you find yourself comfortable in a situation like Alice or doing what you were doing with Richie? Or do you just prefer to be live from Hollywood? It's Orianti and I'm here I am. You know what? I love working with Alice and I, I yeah. love doing my you know what I mean? And I love being like, and working, you know, when I work with MJ and just different, you know, performers like that and Carrie Underwood. And when I get to guest with different amazing like artists and different genres and you just kind of just go with it, that's really fun for me. It really is. I, I really enjoy that. Um, but other than that, no, I really like, you know, being with my own band and doing that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Talking about your own band and, and MJ, I mean, you got to know Michael Bearden through the experience with uh, This Is It and everything, and now you kind of have him in your band on this record, which must be really cool to be sort of his boss this time. Right, and he wrote for for some songs on the, on the RSO <laughs> record as well. Good dude. Yeah, he's he's amazing. Um, you know, Michael has been, you know, since you know calling me up to join This Is It, he has been like a brother to me and just a mentor and just someone who I call up all the time for advice. And, and we've written a lot of songs together. He wrote some new ones too, um, for future stuff and, and him to come in and play the bourbon room with me as well with Glenn and all that is just really an honor and, and wonderful. He's an incredible, incredible human and, and musician. So, yeah. yeah. From a musician standpoint, it was really cool because the, this is it. I mean, that movie, when it came out, of course, I mean, unfortunately, he passed away and everything. And it was in like such shitty circumstance. And we got to see that behind the scenes curtain pulled back on the creative process. 
it was almost like a musical awakening for me. And it was like there were so many revelations to see how involved he was in the process, even musically with the arrangements and the keyboard sounds. Did you have that from Michael, like with your guitar playing and your tone? Like, did he say, oh, you know, it needs to sound like the beat it guitar tone or you need that clean, funky oh, sound? Yeah, totally. I mean, I had to change my amps a few times. Um, I called up Paul and I'm like, Paul, we got to get a guitar that sounds kind of like a Strat PRS because he wants to hear the funky parts, but I couldn't hear the Strat. So there were a lot of things that he, attention to the detail, I mean, he heard everything. Um, and, you know, it, was, it came down to the dancing, our outfits, the way just everything. I mean, it was um, a full on insane show, epic proportions, you yeah. know, and he just, um, you know, Swarovski crystals and everything as well with giant spiders. And there's a lot of stuff going on, you know, and, and it was incredible just to be able to work with him for, I think it was like two or three months, something like that. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. So pretty wild and being able to just like exactly what you were saying, like watching him work with, with the musicians and then, and then giving me guidance and then just, he was very supportive and very like of everybody. Just, he wanted everyone to step up and do their thing. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I thought it was just really cool watching him because, like, you know, a lot of people don't appreciate his musicality in a sense. Like, I picture him being the type of guy that goes, yeah, you know what, that guitar part, that needs to be played on a single coil pickup. Like, I feel like he's that type of, like, you know, <laughs> meticulous Detail, kind of artist. Detail-oriented, right. It, he totally was, though. That's the thing. He, he heard everything from the – I mean, he goes, oh, you know, could you change the settings on your amp? Like, he said it one time, and I was like, absolutely. He's like, yeah, I want it to be a little thinner. I want it to cut through a little more. I want you to play this part. And so, yeah, I mean, it was – it was great. And working with Bearden and everybody, I mean, just seeing Jonathan Moffat. I mean, what a great Sugarfoot, what an incredible drummer. I just did a session with him the other day for his album. So that's pretty oh, nice. wild what he's doing. Yeah, he's awesome. Do you still have all your old gear from like This Is It, like sitting around? Do you still use any of it? I do have, yeah, I do have a couple of storage units full of things. <laughs> um, we went through it the other day. <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> when you get a gig like that, are you allowed to just go in and be like, yeah, so I want this, this, this. Like, is it just like, a, like here's the credit card, buy what you want? Oh, Free yeah. shopping. Well, the thing is, having the support of all these different companies that come in, and of course, you know, they, I've got so many different amplifiers I've been through different, you know, with different companies from, from Marshall to EVH to, you know, all of that. So, yeah, I do have quite a few um, and plus amps I've bought as well over the years. Um, there's a lot between like here in, in America and Australia. Um, yeah, a lot. Right. Um, in terms of just, uh, in fact, I'm going to ask you this in passing. Uh, since you worked with Richie, uh, of course, Alec John Such passed away recently. Uh, yeah. Have you ever had a chance to meet him or talk to him or, or do you have any thoughts about him? Yeah, I mean, what a great, great bass player and sweet person. I met him at the Rock and Roll uh, Hall of Fame, and he was really sweet. I remember just him coming up with his girlfriend at the time, and, and just we just sat there and spoke with him and Tico, and he was very just sweet, you know, right. and such a shock, like, you know, hearing that yesterday. So bless him, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um in terms of uh, the future, the the live album comes out in July. Mm -hmm. What's our plan? Do we do we head out on the road extensively? Do you just sort of do a few shows and then back in the studio? Where are we going from from this point on? Well, Rock Candy is coming out in, I believe, well, we're shooting the music videos for the first two singles right. next week. Okay. So that's going to, um, and then we're looking at touring Asia. I've got like a whole tour there set up, um, and then obviously here in the u.s as well in australia and all that just putting it all together but it's been i've just been in the studio like so much like getting this you know dvd done just setting everything up with a label and um and yeah so there's a lot of things a lot of plans for uh for some shows and and festivals over in you know europe as well too that's gonna be really fun Oh, yeah. that's great. And, and you know, it's it's great to to see that Glenn Sobel's on this because he's such a great drummer. And, and of course, uh, what he does with Cooper is just fantastic. Um, in terms of um, uh, the, the the Raw Candy record, when does that come out? Um, I believe the whole album comes out end of July, August, I think. <laughs> so I don't know the exact date, but, um, yeah, pretty sure around that. Yeah. Right. So soon couple of months but the singles are coming out before that obviously Sweet. so i don't yeah yeah and the and the dvd is coming out the 15th i believe this mm -hmm. month. Yeah. is it still gonna a, be yeah. 
is it still a DVD market or you go to like Disney Plus or Amazon and try and sell it to them? Like, oh, here's the streaming concert. Like, because I'm still well, a physical product guy. I still love going to the store and buy my Blu-ray, but you know. Right. Well, that, I was wondering about that because I don't know who really owns DVD players. <laughs> they told me. <laughs> I was like, hey, you know, go on eBay and try to, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, I guess people do and that's the thing. So we, we did it and yeah, people, and we weren't number one in Japan, but mm. really, really cool on the pre-orders. Um, and so yes, I think people in Japan own DVD players. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I but, still own my Blu-ray and DVD. I got, uh, I'm getting my 4K one. Uh, I'm upgrading all my, uh, my whole collection. So, you know, I'm one of those nerdy guys. <laughs> yeah, no, I do have a DVD player. I think, I believe it's in my storage somewhere. So I'm going to, I'm going to find it <laughs> and watch it. <laughs> it's next to like a Palmer speaker simulator somewhere in her, like uh, in her storage unit. <laughs> oh yes. Yeah. Um, it, just real quick. And I, and I know this is the typical question that you always get, but in terms of influences, because when I listen to you play, I don't hear, Oh, that's an Eddie Van Halen move or, Oh, that's a Michael Shaw. I don't hear that. All I hear is Orianti, but where did you get your inspiration from? Who are your players? Uh well, thank you. I mean, I listened to a lot of like BB King uh, right. when I was young, vibrato that drove me crazy. I remember my dad put on um, Thriller's Gone, and it was BB and had his three three five, and he was like hitting just one note for that mm. vibrato, and it took me forever to try to get it. And when I did, I was like so excited. Um, and so he was a main, he was the first guitar lead guitar player that I listened to, and then mm. um, I listened to a lot of like Roy Orbison, the Beatles, Elvis. When it comes to songwriting. Um, you know, Fleetwood Mac, um, Bonnie Raitt, Eric Clapton, um, definitely Eric Clapton. And obviously, I mean, Santana was the main influence for me, definitely. Gary Moore, um, wow. you know, a lot of, I'm just, and Freddie King. I love Freddie King, Albert King. Um, my dad just had a great record collection that he, just, I, I felt like I, I grew up in a time warp because all the other you know, kids were listening to Top 40, like Backstreet Boys or New Kids on the Block or something. And I was listening to like Stevie King, Stevie Ray, you know, all of that good stuff. And and um, John McLaughlin as well. Um, God, Al Miola. There's so many that I, I listen to and, and, you know, learn off of, well, try to learn. Yeah, it really <laughs> was. Awesome. It really was like the, boo like the blues-based players then for you. Right. Yeah, definitely. Blues was the main thing for me. And then um, Latin rock with Santana. So he kind of blended it all. It's kind of this fusion yeah. thing um, I love. So, um, yeah, I didn't really get into the whole like shredding thing until, it's funny enough, I was reading the articles in Guitar World, Guitar Play magazines, about Steve Vai and Joe Satriani and then, you know, Eric Van Halen. And I was like, okay, well, I should probably get into that, you know, and start like listening to it so um and that was just before i i got the call from my manager at the time that i was going to open for steve Vai, and so i was like oh my god this is crazy so you know it's pretty um it's pretty wild i mean all the different uh, it's endless possibilities with the guitar that's the right. cool thing about yeah. the different sound tones and things you can blend i mean jimmy hendrix i should say that was he was a huge influence for me it just blew my mind when my dad put on the band of gypsies and woodstock performance and you know i was like wow it's just so many different colors and he just went on tan it's like john john coltrane or wayne shorter you know the way they sort of play right like that's the way that jimmy would kind of take us on this journey it was almost like jazz fusion but it was rock and it was blues and it was just no one that had ever you know seen it or heard you know, guitar played that way before well that's so what i was gonna say like, it was it was so innovation innovative because nobody had ever heard this before it really was a journey when you heard it incredible yeah. The live record with Buddy Miles, I mean, that I listened to on vinyl and it's insane. But I listened to it, I was like, wow, because you feel like you're in the room. Yeah. And I love that. All those organic sounding recordings just like in the room. So, yeah. so how was it then when you get to Alice Cooper in terms, because it's, it's definitely not that kind. He's not a blues-based rocker. Was it strange for you? Did you learn something from him and go, oh, okay. Yeah. Was it, new. was it difficult from a technical standpoint to go from blues to be a little shreddier? Not really, no. Is that because you know Steve Hunter was in the band when I first right. joined? He's mm. kind of he's got some bluesy, you know. His his uh, the way he his phrasing is is amazing. I don't even want to play. I want to just listen to Steve play. Sitting <laughs> watching Steve, yeah. <laughs> well, it's true. You listen to the '80s and late like or late '80s, early '90s Cooper, and it's got that '80s sound. But the early Alice Cooper band stuff, like there's a lot of bluesy, cool stuff going on. Right, there but is. 
And then you've got Halo of Flies, which um, is a nine-minute kind of orchestrate. Yeah. I, I think Atlas said that the guitar players were all on different drugs, so they were just trying to, you know, it was like this <laughs> crazy thing. Um, and they orchestrated it, and it's nine minutes long. So for me, it was just retaining, like, just to memorize the part. That we're, not that it was hard for me. It was just remembering the parts, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and not get bitten by a python or squashed by, you know, Frankenstein. <laughs> Or, but you, you see, this is why I thought when you went off and did the the shows with Richie, when you go to YouTube now and you see, you know, the band you and, and Richie doing "Wanted Dead or Alive" or "I'll Be There," there's that bluesy rocks influence, and you just bring something to those songs where they just take on a whole new life. And you, as a fan, I just as a fan of Bon Jovi, especially, I go, "Wow, that's a that's a new twist. Way to go!" And so that's what I loved, you know. Oh, yeah, and it was fun because I mean, you know, obviously listening to those songs on the radio in Australia, I mean, Bon Jovi's massive everywhere, you know? And, and so, um, yeah, it was, it was really cool to be able to like play those songs and, and be able to play some of those festivals and people just go crazy, you know? And, and it was still now like when you hear living on a prayer and those, that opening, um, you know, riff and everything, it's just, it's crazy. It's, it's awesome. Freaking awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You see, I'm, I'm still waiting for my RSO live album. That's what I'm waiting for. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, who knows what, happened, you know, and that's the thing. It's like, when you create music together and, and, you know, your friends and, and you just kind of go, okay, well, this is, you know, you're just really proud of it. You know, we spent a long time on that record with with Bob and owning it on the songs. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, you just life. I mean, you just, all these different, like, journeys you kind of find yourself on. It's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, great song. Great album. Anyway, uh, Jeremy? Yeah, look, I mean, live from Hollywood, coming out July 15th. You can pre-order it now wherever you get your music. Of course, you can uh, buy the CD, the vinyl, the DVD. Come on. DVD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pre-order it. On Spotify. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Pre-order it wherever you get your music, and you can watch the performance of Contagious now on YouTube. Make sure you like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and uh, pre-order this record. I mean, this it's absolutely brilliant, phenomenal performance, and you got some of the greatest musicians today performing some incredible songs live. What more do you want? And you got already Anthony. I'm, I'm very honored they joined me and I hope people enjoy it. I mean, the comments have been really good on Contagious. Sin as Him is coming out, I believe, next week. Um, so that's going to be you. And um, yeah, I can't wait for everyone to hear Rock Candy. And there'll be many more recordings coming out after that, which I can't talk about right now. But yes, lots of recordings. Awesome. <laughs> I've been in the- oh, and I'm and playing hopefully the- Montreal shows. I'm sorry? And hopefully a show in Montreal at some point. Yeah. We oh, need, absolutely. We need that. Yeah. 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 There you go. Yeah. I think I played up there, what is it, 2012 or something with Adam Lambert, I believe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was twenty. That yeah. was when he put out that song. Uh, we were playing it on the beat. See, I'm the hot AC guy. I should know the song title. <laughs> yeah, really? I remember that was a fun festival outside, and it was like I remember it being super hot and just like twenty thousand people. And yeah, yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure it was Oceaga. Was it Oceaga? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Some festival. Oh. I one was in Montreal. I remember, and that tour was pretty wild. It was fun times, you know, back then. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, honey, listen to that. What a, what a great career. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, as always. I'm really excited. Um, I'm performing here in Nashville on Wednesday at the Gibson Garage. Um, I have my signature Gibson that came out, which is really cool, and my acoustic. So, yeah. Awesome. More stuff. So, yeah. You have to send me one for a review package. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Arianti. Always a pleasure. Hey, much love. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. The Mitch LaFon and Jeremy White Show. The Mitch LaFon and Jeremy White Show. Available wherever you stream. Catch up on past interviews and episodes on demand now. Subscribe so you don't miss any of it.